Good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Christensen. My pronouns are she, her, and I am delighted to kick off my Saturday morning with you here at Solidarity Saturday. Um, we're going to start right here at 10 a.m. and jump into our program. We're excited to have a wonderful lineup of panelists and um, information to share with you today. As a reminder, Solidarity Saturdays is a virtual space for North Dakotans to build communities of empowered and informed advocates so we can raise our voices, support each other, and work for justice and equity. I want to give a big shout out to the planning team, my colleagues in preparing these events for us, Amy Jacobson with Prairie Action, Andrew Bouchard with, ND, uh, with AFL-CIO, Cody Schuler from ACLU, Emma Hildebrandt with the Prairie Action Institute, Carrie Brecker with Moms Demand Action, and then my colleague Madison Ziegler and I are with Planned Parenthood. Uh, we have a couple community agreements we like to share at the beginning of each session. To better connect as a community, we ask that you please leave your cameras on if you are comfortable. All microphones will be muted to maintain sound quality because we tend to have a large um, turnout in these groups, which is really amazing. We ask that you please be kind and respectful as we delve into these topics and share our thoughts and feelings. And then we encourage you to use the chat to connect as a community and to continue building those connections offline. So for today, we um, have our icebreaker like we usually do, and then we'll go into a little bit of trivia. Uh, we're really excited this morning to have Karen Olson from the Center for Social Research at NDSU with us to really delve into breaking down social determinants of health here in our state of North Dakota. Then we have two amazing panelists who are going to do a deeper dive into a couple specific topics. As always, we'll provide you with some legislative updates and actions that you can take, and then we will say goodbye until next month. Um, so it's time for us to do our um, icebreaker and say, say hello to each other. We like to see where everyone is from. Um, what you're going to do here is move that cursor up to the top of your screen and a little toolbar will come down. Look for annotate. It's a little crayon icon. And if it's not there, you can select more and then go to annotate and pick your favorite stamp. We like the heart, but you can do whatever you prefer. And we would love to see where you're joining us from in the state of North Dakota. Um, if you're from out of the state, you can go ahead and just put your little marker somewhere else. But we like to see where everyone is joining us from. We like to see more and more hearts show up every single month. Um, if you don't want to use your little stamp, you can actually just go ahead and post it in the chat where you are and we'll stamp for you. And then also in the chat, we're really curious here as a planning committee to see what issues are top of mind as we head into these final few weeks of the session. So is there a particular bill? Is there a particular topic that is sticking out to you? Oh, it looks like we have a nice um, representation from around the state. So let's start seeing in the chat, what are some of those issues that are top of mind as we head into these final few weeks? What are you following? Child care, yes. Yeah, the LGBTQ issues are pretty heavy uh, this year. Yeah, <laughs> transgender healthcare pronouns, parents' right, trying to feed our students in schools, school lunches, book banning, the censorship bills. Yeah, so please go ahead and continue to post those in there. Um, so we can keep an eye on what's important to those of you who are joining us. Um, and at this point in time, we'll go ahead and clear off those hearts and stars and I'll move on to our next slide. Thank you. All right, so here's our little trivia game. We're gonna show what you know. Um, so you can go ahead and post your answers in the chat here. All right, so question number one. The Constitution of North Dakota limits regular session to 80 days. How many days have been used up so far this year? 49, 53, 62, or 68. So of those 80 days, how many do you think have been used up? Oh, we're getting a variety of answers here. 68, 62, 53. Um, we are 
at 62. We're at 62 days in. Um, so we're down to our final few weeks. If you check out the legislative website, it says that they're tentatively aiming for May 4th as an end date. Um, but we do know that they like to try to save a couple days. They, they prefer not to use up those full 80 days if possible. So we do know that we're down to our final few weeks. Okay, next question for you. 10 days after defeating a bill to increase access to free school lunches for low-income K-12 students, the North Dakota Senate approved legislation to increase meal stipends for themselves and other state employees. How many senators voted to increase their meal stipend while rejecting increased access to school meals for kids? And as a friendly reminder, we have 47 um, state legislators. So how many of them increased stipends for themselves, but not for kids. We've got three, 13, 33, and 43. And the answer to this is 13. So 13 of them um, voted in that way. All right, question number three. Senate Bill 2360 is one of the two obscenity bills that would ban certain materials from libraries. According to the bill's fiscal note, how much money would be needed for the state library to review materials to ensure compliance with the law? So 269,000, we should be able to find a list of those 13 who, who voted to increase their own meal stipends and, and not feed our kids. All right, so um, the answer to this one is actually A. It's right at about 270,000. A couple of things I wanna point out about this is 270,000 is the amount that would be needed for the first year of the biennium and 173,000 is what the state library would need for the second year of the biennium. Another thing to point out is this is just the North Dakota State Library. This is not the amount that would be needed for every single other public library in the state. The Fargo Public Library, the Minot Public Library, the Bismarck Public Library, all these other libraries that would have to do this too. This money is just simply for one of our libraries. All right, next up, on Thursday, Governor Burgum signed into law a bill that mandates public schools show a high definition ultrasound video that Senator Murdahl refers to as divine and an amazing view into the womb. Opponents of the bill said that the class content decisions belong to school boards, districts, and teachers, not our state lawmakers. Of the 91 representatives voting on this bill last week, how many of them opposed it? Four, eight, 12, or 16. How many do you think opposed this? All right, and the answer is 16. 16. So I would say the good news is that opposition to this bill was bipartisan, but I think the bad news is that under 20% of our House of Representatives right now really believes and supports that idea of local control um, when it comes to our schools and our school districts. And I got one last question for you here. We're starting to see uh, Governor Burgum veto bills, including a harmful bill that would have limited a school's ability to follow best practices regarding our transgender youth. Hundreds, hundreds of North Dakotans reached out to their legislators asking them to support the veto. And fortunately, the veto was sustained by the House. How many other harmful bills targeting transgender individuals are currently on Burgum's desk? Eight, six, four, or two? getting some answers here. Huh. I think we're 
Yeah, it's eight. It's eight. Um, and I want to point out that this is heavy. I want to acknowledge that, that this is, is really weighing on a lot of our minds and our hearts. Um, what brings me hope in this situation is that hundreds of people did reach out to Doug Burgum about this, the bill mentioned in the question here, and, and, and he listened. I mean, we did get that veto. He vetoed and the House actually sustained it. So our voices do matter. Um, as we move through this session, Solidarity Saturday, and especially at the end, we'll have some actions that you can take so you can express how you feel, how you want, what you want your lawmakers and our governor to know. Um, thank you for playing this game with me. I am now going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Amy Jacobson, and she'll lead us through the rest of Solidarity Saturday. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. It's always so it's always so great to start every every Saturday or every Saturday once a month. We start our Saturdays this way, getting to know who's on who's joining us today, where you're at and what you're thinking about. So thank you for participating in that. Um, like Katie said, my name is Amy Jacobson. I am the executive director of Prairie Action ND. We are a communication and digital advocacy organization that focuses on um, lifting up and amplifying progressive values and voices in North Dakota. Uh, so, so happy to have you all here today. You know, we're going to be digging in a little bit deeper on a topic of that some of you are probably familiar with, but many of you may not be. And that is we're going to be hearing from some local experts and some advocates about social determinants of health. And those are the conditions in which people born, um, they, where you're born, where you grow, live, uh, work and age in North Dakota and how that impacts our people and our communities. Uh, and so today we're going to be first learning about research uh, and some data and exploring what social determinants of health are in North Dakota and how they're impacting people. And then we're going to dive a little bit more deeper into that topic by talking with some local advocates about the communities, how social determinants of health impact the communities which their uh, organizations are serving and what that means to the people and families in North Dakota. Uh, so first I'm going to introduce you to our guest speaker today and that is Karen Olson. Karen is a research specialist with the Center for Social Research at North Dakota State University. In this role, Karen's ba um, background in demographics and social uh, socioeconomics is used to facilitate the public's access to data and information needed to make decisions, design and um, design and implement programs, and invest in communities across the state. Her efforts involve a wide range of topics, including migration, char characteristics of the aging population, community efforts to reduce poverty, housing needs, and health and well-being of children and families. Karen has formerly served as a program director for North Dakota Kids Count, where she uh, worked to provide legislators, public officials, and child advocates with reliable data and tools to advance policies that benefit children and families in North Dakota. Um, so Karen, thank you for that work. And uh, also I should say that we work still are working with North Dakota Kids Count a lot this legislative session um, uh, and providing some information about working families and children in North Dakota. So thank you for your time there as well. Um, so uh, please, I'm gonna let you take take the rain here. Great. Well, good morning. And thank you so much for uh, having me here today to share some of the results from the study we conducted on behalf of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Caring Foundation. So let me share. Great. So the social determinants of health are, they're becoming an increasingly important framework for understanding health, right? The idea that the conditions in which we live, work, and play impact our health. Health is not simply uh, going to the doctor or pharmaceuticals. It's much more complex than that because health begins in how we relate to one another. It begins in strong, healthy families. It begins in, in safe neighborhoods with good sidewalks and close proximity to grocery stores that have healthy food. And it begins in our jobs that we can get to safely that are free from unnecessary hazards. Uh, schools that educate provide that foundation for youth to become successful in adulthood that provides healthy meals and sends them home safe at the end of the day. And of course, health also begins in having the time and the financial resources to play at the end of a hard day's work because we know that that unrelieved stress can take a toll on our hearts and our immune systems. So all of these determinants, they are interwoven and no one issue stands alone. A quick example to illustrate what I'm talking about today. 
there was an individual who fell on some hard times. He lost his home and he found himself in a homeless shelter. He still had a car and a job, but he just, he wasn't feeling well and he really needed to see a doctor. He was able to get to a doctor, make an appointment, and then he was diagnosed with, <clears throat> with diabetes. But he did receive a prescription for insulin, was able to pay for it, but he was just unable to control his illness and his doctor was baffled. Well, it turns out at the shelter, he didn't have access to a refrigerator for his insulin, making it ineffective. Unable to control his disease impacted his ability to hold a, his job full time, which affected his ability to save for a deposit first month rent on an apartment where he would have access to his own refrigerator managed his illness and get healthy. So this is an instance where access to care and medication was simply not enough, right? The conditions in which he lived had just as much of an impact on his overall health as the medication that he received. So by understanding what all of these factors are, these social determinants, we then have that many more opportunities to improve health and well-being in our communities. So our approach to the overall study with the, with the Caring Foundation was to look at specific measures within each of these five determinants. We also looked at health behaviors, and then we concluded with overall health outcomes, those physical and mental wealth health outcome measures that are they're greatly impacted by both these social determinants as well as our own behaviors. Within the report itself, you'll find that each measure we looked at is disaggregated by age, race, income, education, as well as by county when possible. And this morning, we're going to briefly cover a few of the summary findings from this study. Within the economic stability domain, we chose to look at poverty specifically because income and poverty play such a critical role, not only in our current health, but in our future health. Because once we get in poverty, it can become very difficult to escape, right? It can have generational effects. Now, overall, North Dakota's economy is, is very strong relative to the rest of the nation. Whether we look at GDP, household income, unemployment, North Dakota ranks well nationally and has seen tremendous growth since 2010. Yet despite this improvement, about one in 10 people still live below poverty and simply don't have enough to cover their basic living expenses. And statistically, there's been very little improvement, down only one point from 2010. The poverty rate is also 11% for children, but this does jump to 29% for those children living with a single parent, which is seven times greater than for those living with two parents. When disaggregated by race and ethnicity, the poverty rate decreased for each racial group over the past 10 years, which is a very positive trend. Uh, but despite this, um, populations specifically in our indigenous communities, which have endured a legacy of racial discrimination, face significant ongoing barriers uh, to financial stability. And it's important to understand also that being poor in a relatively well-off community with good infrastructure and schools is very different from being poor in a place where uh, poverty rates have been high for generations, where um, economic investment in schools, infrastructure is lower, and where opportunities in general to build wealth are more limited. The hurdles are also high in rural areas where Things like low population density, physical isolation, and, and a broader spatial distribution makes things like service delivery and uh, exposure to innovative programs more of a challenge. Now, what we mean by poverty is a reference to an official threshold based on family size. So for example, the current threshold for a family of four with two children is about $26,000, give or take an amount below which a family simply does not have enough to cover their expenses. Now, in order to have enough, research has suggested that in North Dakota, one really needs two to three times that threshold to attain a modest, adequate standard of living. So if we look at the number of people with income up to two times that poverty rate, so above poverty, but less than 200%, often referred to as near poverty, there are 107,000 people in this category, close to poverty, potentially struggling, 
and have incomes that potentially qualify them for support. For example, Medicaid covers children up to 175% for children. If we combine these and look at the 11% below poverty and the 15% who are near it, that's 26% or one in four people in North Dakota living either in or near poverty. And this becomes important because at these lower income levels, one missed paycheck can set a whole host of unfortunate things in motion. Within the education domain, we first looked at young children and the importance of those very early years because finding quality, affordable childcare is vital for many working parents in the state. It enables them to remain in the workforce, support their households financially. Currently, just over half, about 54% of North Dakota's workforce are parents. And it is likely that most of them will need quality, affordable childcare in some form at some point. And so to understand this situation better, we looked at <clears throat> the number of uh, licensed childcare spots in North Dakota. So the supply, the childcare supply, and we compared that to the potential need. So the number of young children zero to five years old. And we created a ratio from these, which is the number of young children for every one licensed childcare spot. When this ratio exceeds three to one, meaning three children for every one spot, research has determined that these areas are can be referred to as childcare deserts, meaning that the number of spots is likely insufficient and that there's a greater likelihood uh, that parents will face difficulties finding care. Now in North Dakota, the two darkest blue uh, colors on this map represent those counties where that ratio exceeds three to one and are considered our childcare deserts in the state. Um, and of course, this type of measurement likely even overestimates availability because even if available, it may not meet the specific needs of a parent. For example, it might not align with their work schedule, the age of the child, or there might be things like transportation or language barriers uh, in the mix as well. In addition to supporting working families and strengthening the overall state's economy, quality childcare and early learning opportunities are also critical for early childhood development because the best time to build those foundational skills, ensure healthy development and uh, prevent inequity is in the very early stages of childhood. Later skills in schooling, employment, they build cumulatively upon those early skills. In North Dakota, 31% of young children ages three and four were enrolled in an early learning preschool type program in 2020, and that is the lowest percentage of any state in the nation. Nationally, it's about half, 47% uh, of young children are enrolled. In terms of healthcare providers or the healthcare workforce, there are areas called HPSAs or healthcare professional shortage areas. And these are designations used to uh, identify areas, facilities, or population groups that are experiencing a shortage of healthcare professionals. And there are three categories of HPSAs. Uh, there is a primary medical, shortage area, dental, and a mental health professional shortage area. As of last fall, an estimated one third of all people in North Dakota lived in a primary care professional shortage area, 36%. One fourth lived in a dental care professional shortage area, and nearly half, 46% of North Dakota's population lived in a mental health care professional shortage area. In terms of um, outcomes, um, everything we've talked about so far, these social determinants, as well as our behaviors, which we haven't covered today, they all have an impact on overall health outcomes, those physical and mental well-being characteristics of a community. And there's many ways to measure this. Uh, life expectancy is one of the most commonly used measures to assess the overall health of a population. It measures how long a baby born in a given year might expect to live. And in North Dakota, average life expectancy fell for the second consecutive year down to 77 in 2020. 
In addition to physical outcomes, mental health outcomes are also concerning. Our mental health helps to determine how we handle stress, how we relate to others and make choices. And rates of poor mental health are on the rise in North Dakota. And disparities in mental health persist across age, gender, education, income, as well as race. Frequent mental distress can lead to thoughts of suicide. 135 people died by suicide in 2020. When compared to other forms of death, suicide was the 11th leading cause for all ages in 2020. It is the second leading cause of death for people ages 15 to 44. Also, the suicide rate increased for all age groups and racial categories over the past 10 years. In particular, indigenous populations are almost twice as likely as white, black, and Hispanic populations to die by suicide in North Dakota. And finally, we looked at drug overdose deaths. 114 in 2020, nearly a 400% increase from 23 deaths in 2010. Also, the number of overdose deaths increased regardless of race, gender, age. In fact, the rate of deaths due to overdose is now two to three times higher for each age, gender, and racial category that we looked at. In, in terms of an overall summary, I think once you've had a chance to review the entire report, which I would encourage you to do, I think that I think everyone will have their own takeaways, your own priorities and areas of focus. But I think it's important to note that all of these determinants, as well as our behaviors, they are all relevant factors in overall health. They are interwoven, they are interdependent. So let's say we were to focus on affordable housing, right? Because we know how critical it is to have a place to call home. It provides that stability to focus on other things such as stable employment, for instance. Employment for families often requires childcare Childcare early learning opportunities are critical to prepare children for school. Young children who receive early learning enter kindergarten better ready to learn. They are reading better by third grade. They're more likely to graduate on time, go to college and have higher earnings as a young adult, which all sets the stage for their own asset development, investing in housing, future education of their children, access to quality healthcare, food, exercise, et cetera. That cycle will continue offering multiple avenues for improving health in a community. Overall, North Dakota has many strengths. Our, our population is growing. It's becoming more diverse. Our economy is generally strong overall. North Dakota has many resources, right? Housing costs, while rising, are low relative to the rest of the nation. Most people have enough to eat, are engaged in their community, have access to the internet, exercise opportunities, and health care. We have many strengths, right? And that allows us the opportunity to affect positive change in many different ways because despite these strengths, the prospect of a vibrant, healthy future is still a challenge for many individuals and families in our state. Some populations experience far greater disparities in health than others. So it's really important to consider how culture, systems, historical practices have impacted the current situation that we're in. Secondly, one fourth of people in North Dakota live in or near poverty. So how do we improve self-sufficiency among our families, develop improvements or enhancements in services and safety nets? Third, quality early education is foundational to future success in school and the workforce, yet North Dakota ranks last in the rate of enrollment. Fourth, and most surprising to me, although we didn't really talk about this, is that when compared to national averages, North Dakota children are more likely to live with someone experiencing mental illness, to live with someone abusing substances, to have a family member in jail, and be a witness to domestic violence. So how do we strategically improve asset development for internal and external asset development for our children and youth? Things like positive identity, resilience, social competencies, those protective factors that um, will help them through potentially traumatic events. And finally, life expectancy is down, mental health concerns are on the rise, alcohol, drug overdose, and suicide are leading factors in premature death in our state. Health care is critical to treating illness and disease, but beyond that, the data consistently show that the social, economic, educational, environmental, behavioral, all of these factors, they contribute 
to the overall health of a community. So by knowing and understanding these data, it allows us to manage our shared resources much more efficiently when making decisions because eradicating illness is, is unlikely, but we can foster health and health begins with healthy relationships, healthy communities, schools, jobs, all of which protect us from those stressors of everyday life. Um, in terms of resources, uh, here's a bit.ly link and a QR code, which will take you directly to a Blue Cross Blue Shield Caring Foundation platform for social determinants of health. From it, you can download our entire report, a two-page executive summary if, you're, if you need something quick. There's also in the middle there, there's a two-page front and back profile that highlights the um, key statistics within each of those domains. And there are also uh, summary findings from two roundtable discussions that took place a couple of weeks ago, one in Bismarck, one in, in Fargo with key leaders in those communities. Um, so I, I recommend you check that out. Uh, in terms of contact information, reach out if you have any questions for me about the study. Also our director, Nancy Hoder, uh, if you have questions about our center or the research or have ideas or efforts that you would like to pursue, please reach out. So thank you so much. And I look forward to today's discussion. Karen, thank you so much for this very insightful information. It really, um, I mean, it really just shows how important all the various aspects of our lives, like where we are born, where we grow up, um, uh, how we age in North Dakota and what it means for our fulfillment in our lives. And it's a lot of what we focused on at, at Solidarity Saturdays over this um, season. Uh, before I do transition to our panel, um, we are asking people to put questions in the chat, but I thought since I have a little bit of time with you right now, one question I did see that I would elevate for you is just um, this important, this information is incredibly important for people who are making policy and policy changes and financial state investments. So can you tell us um, how you, your report was conveyed to the state legislature or to the governor's office? We, um, I believe that uh, Pam Gullison with the Blue Cross Caring Foundation and her team were uh, very active in spreading the word, um, uh, sharing the report, sharing the information. At the roundtable discussion in Bismarck, we had the Lieutenant Governor um, uh, uh, open, open the meeting and discuss all of the various legislative activities, specifically around childcare, which I thought was uh, extremely in interesting. Um, so they are aware and they are very familiar with it. Well, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, and uh, so now, actually, now that we've kind of got a level set on some of the data and statistics that Karen has shared with us in this wonderful report, it has been linked in the chat and it will go out afterwards in the um, in the follow-up email to you all, we're going to transition over to a panel of local advocates and activists um, who work for organizations that um, who deal with um, people or who support people in North Dakota and, and um, to ensure that they have the most fulfilling lives that they can in sometimes very challenging situations. Uh, our panel today is going to be a little bit smaller than we originally intended. So we did invite uh, on and confirm both Michelle Rids from High Plains for Housing. We're going to talk a little bit about um, housing uh, shortages and access and affordability in North Dakota. And Whitney Fear, who's went with Fargo Health Healthcare, and she was going to speak specifically around access to healthcare services and mental health services, both things that were highlighted in Nancy or er, in in Karen's report, uh, but they both are ill today and were unable to join us. Um, so we will make sure that you have information about their organizations in the chat and they will come along and follow up email as well. Um, but we do have with us um, two other speakers, um, Allison Trainer from the National Association of Social Workers in North Dakota and Zoe Absey, who is the Community Initiatives Manager with Great Plains Food Bank. And uh, so the way that we're gonna format this is that they were both provided um, two questions to answer today. And I'm going to, um, I'm hoping you all don't hear my dogs barking in the background right now. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry if you do. Um, they were both provided two questions to answer today. And so I'm just going to let you know what those two questions are. And then I'm gonna have Allison answer those two questions. And then after that, we'll transition and allow um, uh, Zoe to answer those two questions. So. Um, so for you, Allison. Um, so first, Allison Trainer is a president of North Dakota 
a National Association of so Social Workers. She has a master's degree in public health, focusing primarily on the social determinants of health um, regarding deaths of despair, so overdose and suicide. Um, as you know, there are innumerable um, shared risks and protective factors around these issues and other health outcomes. She is currently focusing on suicide prevention and trauma treatment, along with reducing risk factors as a clinical social worker um, working in, in, with incarcerated youth and youth who have been trafficked in North Dakota. Um, so Allison, thank you first for your work and secondly for joining us today. Um, and as you know, uh, the questions for you are were based on your perspective and your expertise, how do social determinants of health impact the population which you serve? And how can North Dakota use um, these social determinant of health factors to identify solutions to the disparities and the barriers that people that you work with face? Um, and please feel free to pepper in anything else that you think is incredibly important as we look at social determinants of health um, and potentially anything that's happening at the legislature as well. Yeah, gosh, thank you for having me. And it's so exciting to see so many people here that are invested in this topic. Um, and there's a lot to say. I do have some notes because I could go off on so many rabbit holes. Um, so because this is so I'm so passionate about this. So early on as a social worker, I worked in tribal communities, uh, specifically uh, doing crisis work for suicide, working in uh, at Turtle Mountain and then also in Spirit Lake. And I became very passionate about suicide. I saw how common it was and how many complex environmental factors were at play. And then so I really looked at, at I went back to school and became a public health professional working to impact suicide across the state as the suicide prevention director, um, but went on to also get my clinical license as a clinical social worker. So I've been, I've kind of had uh, feet in both um, sides of social work and public health practice, macro impacting the big picture. Um, so I co-founded the suicide prevention coalition that works on some of these shared risk and protective factors with other community um, and, and state entities, such as um, the North Dakota Department of Health and Human Services, Indian Affairs Commission, and, and other partners. Meanwhile, I've been working at the youth correctional facility with incarcerated youth that ex are really in the deep end, having experienced these complex, um, you know, poorer social de uh, determinants of health. So I have, um, there's a lot of ways that I could answer this question, but I really just kind of want to talk about generally how what this has to do with the social determinants of health and then some of the things that I've seen personally that really um, both hurt my heart but also has given me a lot of hope about the work that's being done across North Dakota. So uh, the social work profession has long understood that marginalized communities experience poor health and mental health outcomes. You know, you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we've all studied that at the bottom everybody needs things like secure housing, um, safety, security, clean water, food, access to proper health and mental health care, education, community and social capital, access to healthy recreation, like uh, it was mentioned, being able to walk somewhere safely, to play with your kids, um, and a protective culture of health rather than um, a, an unhealthy culture. So when people do have these things, then they can start working on other things like wellness, that sense of efficacy and really finding, you know, finding health. If we're in poverty, we're not, we're just trying to make ends meet. We're not necessarily looking at getting all our greens or exercising. And so as a social worker, both doing clinical practice and looking at the big picture, macro practice or public health approaches, I find that I really, it's hard to engage youth in something like trauma treatment and treatment when they don't have enough food to eat, right? So the approach that I've taken, particularly with our trafficked youth and incarcerated youth is filling those fundamental needs, working with a team to ensure those needs are met, and then working with our larger coalitions to help address some of those bigger pictures within our marginalized community. So we know, and we've talked about, Karen did a fantastic job of, of providing an overview and really making those linkages to things like suicide, because, um, you know, I was just talking to some of my colleagues about suicide, and it's hard for some people to make that leap and see that the same risk factors that impact things like heart disease and um, contribute to things like um, diabetes also contribute to things like early death 
from suicide. So living in chronic poverty with chronic stress, we know that impacts the brain. And we know that poor determinants of health contribute to the populations I serve because youth that are raised in marginalized communities are more likely to engage in such activities as selling drugs to support their families. Um, and youth are at increased risk of being recruited and sold in human trafficking. So anyone in North Dakota can develop these conditions, right? I'm not saying that, that this is always the case, but what I'm saying is that it increases the risk. There's more stress, The there's more, um, and, and particularly um, our tribal communities are, are uh, disproportionately represented among the young people that I serve. So uh, we see that these factors greatly impact depression and suicide. And those with poor determinants of health, indigenous communities, and individuals with less access to support, health care, mental health care services, proper education, or um, access to uh, positive employment are likely to experience these negative health outcomes and even incarceration and, and early mortality. So I think those are just, that's kind of an overview and it's a lot and kind of, um, but what I, what I think is necessary is keeping this lens on when we work with our young people, uh, both individually and when we're engaged in those things like state planning and legislation, it's really hard. Um, it's hard to, to work with individuals in clinical practice knowing that there's these bigger pieces at play. And yet, um, and my heart is just, I, I just have to work with these young people as well. So it gets complicated, uh, but I, I was really excited to be on this panel to hear about the work that you all are doing from a policy standpoint, a legislative standpoint, and a big picture, because uh, working with young people, incarcerated youth, um, individuals that are struggling every day from suicide, I'm, I find that it's very difficult to keep up with the legislation and some of these pieces um, that you all are working so hard to address. But uh, uh, what I have taken away from my work as the suicide prevention director, uh, looking at the public health approach, is that we need we need to get education like this to our policymakers. We need to repeatedly make this information and this education um, uh, simple and clear, just like um, you have done today, Dr. Olson. I think it needs to be. Uh, that's the piece that often is missing. The, we have a lot of policymakers and individuals that are leading, um, that are making decisions that really, they have no concept. You know, if this is, this is not their experience, they may have no concept of how all of these social determinants affect, um, impact the, the young people we serve and how impacting these social determinants could actually prevent costs and, you know, prevent incarceration, prevent um, state funding of specific treatments that may otherwise be unnecessary. Uh, and I think those, that dollars and cents piece, really um, for them to fully understand the, the cost benefits, unfortunately, and the, the pieces that really um, cost benefits, but also those individual stories of people who have been impacted positively by these interventions. As we all know, it's very hard to prove that prevention works. Um, it's very hard to prove that you prevented something that never happened. Uh, but those are the pieces that I think those narratives, the, that advocacy, that call to action, um, that's uh, that's what is needed to impact this uh, if that makes sense. And that's what's really going to help lift the families that I serve, uh, you know, onto an even playing field. Um, so that was a more of a rant, but. No, it was not. Thank you, Allison. It was very important information to be talking about. And I love to hear your the passion that you have for your work, right? And I think it's important to tie, to connect the dots between 
what's happening in people's lived experiences, what's happening in th their access to services and care to help lift them up. And then also like layering it in with the data and making that accessible to legislators. So I do appreciate you really elevating how complex, right? That the environmental factors are on, on individuals and on our futures. And in particular, because I'm somebody who does work with the legislature quite a bit, I do think there would be a good point to point your point about like bringing the information to the legislature is that when we don't necessarily have that lived experience, it can be difficult to understand it, even with providing with with data sometimes. And another thing that factors into that is a lack of diversity in the legislature across the board that will allow more um, a diversity of thought and experiences to be helped shaping that policy. So. Thank you for elevating those things. And I'm going to now turn it over to um, Zoe, who I see in the chat is also a board member with the National Association of Social Workers. I wasn't aware of that, um, but I'm so glad. I think that you're a phenomenal organization and I know that this is uh, your wheelhouse of work. But today, Abby, or Zoe is here today um, from the community uh, from Great Plains Food Bank, where I mentioned that she's a community initiative manager. In her role at Great Plains Food Bank, Zoe works on new solutions to address the root causes of hunger. She also works to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion within the organization, as well as connect, the commu connect with community organizations to create relationships and reduce barriers for all communities. So Zoe is currently getting her master's through Boston University in social work. And she has an undergraduate degree in elementary education from the University of North Dakota. She lives here in Fargo. I say here because that's where I am as well. Um, so Zoe, I know you had the question. And I'm going to open the floor to you to share a little bit of your thoughts with us today. Thank you, Amy. And thanks for everyone having me on the my first Solid Solidarity Saturday. Very excited to be here. Um, and Karen got me all about um, stats and facts with her presentation. So I just wanted to kind of ground level set. Um, at the Great Plains Food Bank, the last in the last year, we served close to 140,000 individuals across the state of North Dakota in Clay County, Minnesota. That's about one in six people and one in four children that we served. Um, sorry, my cat loves presentations. Um, and just a, the meal, uh, the school lunch bill, and everything surrounding that. Um, just to give you guys some background knowledge, we served. 4,812 kids through our backpack program across the state and um, served almost 130,000 meals through our school pantry and 5,500 youth summer meals through our youth summer meal sites. So there is a need. And if kids can have more access to meals, um, they can just like Karen and Allison and me, we're all saying like they can do better and break that cycle of poverty. So it's very, um, very sad. But anyway, thank you, Amy, um, for having me. Uh, social determinants of health is part of our day-to-day -day work at the Great Plains Food Bank. Because we serve the whole state of North Dakota and Clay County, Minnesota, we serve many communities with different obstacles and barriers to food assistance. So we're continuously thinking and working innovatively to make sure our neighbors are getting what they need, want, and deserve. Oftentimes when a neighbor is facing food insecurity, um, they're also facing other barriers in their lives. Like we've, I've, heard prior. Um, with many of our rural and tribal communities, we see a lack of access to affordable um, and nutritious foods. With a lack of grocery stores, um, you are left to purchase lower quality, uh, fast foods, or you're buying expensive foods, so you're not buying everything that you need. Uh, we also see in rural and in our urban, com urban communities as well that transportation is a huge barrier. Um, when one cannot easily access a grocery store or get to a local food pantry that limits their access to resources, therefore they don't utilize them. We hear from a lot of folks that they aren't utilizing the food pantries, meal sites because they don't know where they're at. They don't know how to get there. They don't have transportation to get there. So um, that is a huge barrier. Uh, so sorry, I have notes to keep me on track as well. Language barriers, uh, literacy that all plays into it. If, Basically, having the education to understand the charitable feeding network is huge. If they don't know how to use a food pantry, um, if we're handing out flyers about a local pop-up in English, and if English is not their native language, they're not going to utilize it or they're going to have fear around utilizing it. Um, with our SNAP application, a huge issue is it's long and it's in English. So if you don't have access to a computer or a printer to print it off and go through that application, 
or you don't know English, you're not going to fill it out or go through the process. And then therefore you're missing out on that food assistance. Um, so these are really big things that we're focusing on at the food bank of how to reach these communities, how to have translated materials, how to videos that are spoken rather than in writing so that everyone has access. Um, so ultimately, we know if you don't have access to healthy, affordable foods, your health will suffer, your education will suffer, and your employment will suffer because without fueling your body, it's difficult to do or think of much else um, besides food and feeding your family. Uh, we have a mobile food pantry program that goes across the state, mainly to places that don't have food pantries or access to a local grocery store, and we provide produce and shelf-stable food items. So at these events, we see that uh, folks will line up three hours ahead of the distribution time because they are worried that we will run out of food before we reach them in line. So living in that food crisis scarcity mindset makes little room to think of other things and creates stress not only in the adults but also in children. So if we want to break that cycle of poverty and end hunger, we have to look at all aspects of the individual, not just the one that is presenting in front of us at that moment. And we have to get to the root causes of why are they experiencing food insecurity in the first place and work upstream rather than reactionary, let's get them food right now. Let's see what those causes are and create solutions to, to those issues so they don't have to use the charitable feeding network. Um, and so kind of how North Dakota, how um, solutions to these, I think one of the most important ways is for each of us in our and our organizations to look at our policies, our practices within our programming and structures and address the systemic and structural racism that may be present. Looking at our own biases, working on our organization's biases um, and changing those and uh, learning and growing so we can be more equitable for all communities. Um, I also think that we work in many siloed worlds and how can we come together and collaborate, knowing what organizations are out there, what they're doing in our communities so that we can better connect individuals to those services. Um, if they're coming to us because of food, how, what else can we assist them with? Oh, High Plains for Housing or uh, NDSU Extension, Community Action, like how can we better assist folks that are coming to us individually? Um, and then for everyone else who maybe isn't working in an organization with direct service of looking critically and thinking critically about your community and what are the needs there and what are uh, what are ways that we can create the more access within our communities what's missing what I mean in Fargo transportation is a huge issue map bus doesn't run on Sundays so for folks that are trying to get to a meal site to have a warm meal they have to walk, I mean, to Micah's Mission in Moorhead or to New Life Center if they're not allowed at Salvation Army. So there's a lot of barriers for folks even to receive a hot meal on a Sunday. So just looking critically at your, at your space and how we can do better. Thank you so much for digging in a little about, about food insecurity in North Dakota and the different things that impact people's ability to access the that services. I also thought it was really important to think about you know, what you said, connecting the, you, the people that you're working with to other services as well. Um, in our work that we've been presenting over this last um, session of Solidarity Saturdays, we have found a, like a very common net theme among the people and the services, that, you know, that are connecting and needing additional help to lift, to, to lift people up and to help sure everybody has access and equity across the board. Um, and we've also highlighted some of the challenges in the system that do exist for people to be able to like language, like you mentioned, like online forms, like all those sorts of things. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, so at this time, we're getting near the end of our hour, and I'm going to thank all of our speakers who joined us today, Karen, Allison, and Zoe. Thank you for sharing your insight into social de determinants of health and what it means for a healthy, safe North Dakota. Uh, I know we're all going to take it to heart, and we're going to be armed with important information as we talk about important policy and funding issues as well. Um, and so now, at this point, we're going to take the last we have eight minutes, so it's quite a bit of time. We're going to pop up and let our, we have some calls to action. So people who've been working on policies that impact people and working families in North Dakota, many of which are tied to a lot of the topics that we heard about in, um, in the NDSU report earlier. So I'm going to um, just let folks know who are gonna be speaking with your calls to action. Um, you have about a minute or two to go ahead and do that. So feel free to take that time. Be know that we're gonna have four or five people talking in the next eight minutes. All the 
links are going to go in the chat. All the links are going to go out in an email afterwards. Um, so I'm going to start with, who am I starting with? I guess I'm going to start with Ryan Nagel. I think uh, Ryan is with North Dakota United. Um, uh, Ryan, what's your call to action for us today? Number one, my call to action is my cat to stop uh, making so much noise while I'm trying to talk. I'm enjoying the cat showing up on all these Solidarity Saturdays. Um, uh, the voucher bill that we've been talking about a lot during uh, uh, these sessions before, uh, it's really, it's taking public resources, sending it to, to private schools. Um, we've got serious uh, issues with that. We talked earlier on a Solidarity Saturday about the, the connections of public education and good democracy. Uh, so the action that we have uh, early this week, House Bill 1532 will be on the Senate floor. Uh, we're looking to defeat that. <clears throat> and if we uh, are unsuccessful defeating it uh, in the legislature, I, I want everybody on this call to know we're seriously considering a referral campaign. Uh, we'll be coming at all of you to be a part of that campaign if and when we have to pull the trigger on that. Uh, but it'll be an exciting uh, moment if we if we do have to do that and, and get to win on this issue. So here's the... Uh, the uh, action in the chat. Uh, please take it. Speak up for public education and uh, public public school students. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for that work. And it ties very closely into our topic today and talking about access to quality education and what's at risk if this bill passes or is you know not defeated on a ballot measure in the future. So thank you. I'm going to move on to Andrew Bouchard with the AFL-CIO to talk a little bit about his policy. Hey, thanks, Amy. Uh, here to talk about school meals. So just this week, Governor Burgum signed 1494, which is a meal shaming uh, policy bill. So meal shaming, uh, it largely eliminates it from North Dakota in terms of uh, serving kids alternate meals or banning them from participating in things due to meal debt. Uh, that went through both chambers uh, nearly unanimously. So uh, thanks to everybody on here who worked uh, contacting their legislators on that. Uh, we were able to get that done and that's a big step forward on, on school meals. Uh, we did uh, lose the $6 million in funding by one vote in the Senate after making it through the House, uh, 23 to 24, but it is now under uh, SB 2284, uh, which is a bill uh, that will include the $6 million for school meals up to 200% of the poverty rate, which as we heard today is not actually very much. Uh, and uh, that is a very reasonable thing to do. So keep please pushing on that. I put the action link in the chat and contact your representatives and urge them to pass it next week, uh, 2284, and then contact your senators and, uh, you know, get after them for voting no on it if they voted no. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We know that healthy meals is what creates healthy children and healthy adults. So um, thank you all for, please hop in there and take that. Um, we have three minutes left. So about a minute each, we're gonna start with Carol to talk about voting. Hi, thanks, Amy. Um, well, I'm with the League of Women Voters of North Dakota, and we've been following all sorts of uh, voting related, mostly voting, bad voting bills that have come through the legislature. The one I'm talking about today is the is HB 1273, which is the one that would ban approval voting and ranked choice voting all over the state, including taking away something that the city of Fargo and the citizens of Fargo voted on in 2018, which is approval voting, which we've had both in 2020 and 2022. Um, that passed both houses of, of the legislature. The governor vetoed it and said in his letter that it really goes against local control. Um, the, both houses will vote to possibly overturn this veto on Monday. So those are the people that we need to talk to, especially the senators, because they really need just three senators to change their vote. And then that vote, that veto will be upheld. Thank you, Carol. And thank you to the league for doing that work. And we know that democracy and voting is another social determinant of health. So thank you for elevating that. Last but not least, we're going to turn it over to Cody Schuler from the ACLU to talk. Hey, thanks, Amy. Uh, I wanted to just let everybody know that House Bill 1254, which is the bill that would ban uh, all gender affirming care for minors in the state of North Dakota, has made its way to the governor's desk. And we want to make sure that he vetoes it. So we're going to ask you to take a call to action, which uh, we have both uh, Prairie Action uh, North Dakota and ACLU of North Dakota have actions on this. So choose which one you want to do and uh, and get uh, send it up. Uh, Katie is going to put that in the chat or Carrie. Um, 
But just a little highlight on this bill. So it would ban surgery, something that, doesn't all, that does not happen in North Dakota anyway. So this is an unnecessary, unnecessary bill. It would ban puberty blockers. Opponents say that puberty, puberty blockers are, are irreversible. That's not true. They are reversible. They've been used for decades in different treatments and they are safe and, uh, and they are very helpful for folks going through that are, you know, when they start puberty to be able to help figure out um, what's going on in their lives when they are transgender. And so they're really important. And then it would also block hormone therapy, which is not is, is somewhat rare when it comes to working with minors. Um, but it would when we're getting into that 16, 17, um, you know, pushing 18, really would be important to be able to have access um, to hormone therapy as well. Um, also, it takes away parents' rights. Um, and it would take parents' rights away from their ability to make decisions with and for their children. And opponents say that parents are pushing this, doctors are pushing on this, they're trying to make money um, by pushing this on the kids. None of that is true. And so please take action, send personal stories if you have them. And the last thing is there's a thing in the chat that Katie put in there, um, North Dakota Human Rights Coalition has a video. They've compiled like hours of testimony from doctors, endocrinologists, and can send it into an hour. It is a wonderful resource if you want to learn about the issue and understand gender affirming care. Thanks. Amy. Thank you, Cody. You did that so succinctly. I appreciate that. We're right at 11 o'clock. And to know like while we did rush through these actions, we spent a lot of time on all of these topics this session. And so we know that you've had a lot of background in this work. We're not trying to speed over anything on the transgender action alerts. Please know that one of them has a 500 person goal. We are three people short from hitting that goal. So hop into that link and send that message to the governor, please. Um, it is also about suicide prevention, as Allison mentioned in her conversation. So we're now at the end of Solidarity Saturday for April 8th, 2023. Thank you for making time to join us today. Thank you to all of our speakers for the important information and the really hard and difficult work that you're doing. Um, we are in this together and we are all a part of a larger picture. So thank you again for making time. We will send a recording and the follow-up links uh, early in the week. So if you need anything in the interim, feel free to reach out. Have a nice rest of your day. Bye-bye.